Good evening. Welcome to Distinctive Voices at the Beckman Center. I'm your host, Susan Marty. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Diane France. Wow. What a, what a greeting. What a greeting. Thank you so very much. I have to tell you, this morning was a hoot with those fifth graders. It was so much fun. The, one of the best comments I got was one of the little fifth graders turned around, and, and he's holding the chicken leg, and he said, Science is delicious. <laughs> I just, I loved it. The energy in that room was just incredible. I am honored to have been invited to speak here tonight. When I looked up online to see who had spoken on this very stage before, I'm in lofty company here, and I, I am very honored to have been invited. Tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit about forensic anthropology, and as Susan mentioned, I'd like to take you from start to finish on a homicide case. Usually, when I speak at a, at a group like this, I talk about one of the more famous cases. I talk about the Romanoffs and the identification of Anastasia, or I talk about Jesse James or something like that. But I thought maybe I would do something, with your permission, I'd do something a little bit different tonight. This is a person who, the homicide victim, is a person who does not have a famous name. This person is not known by anyone, and he does now have a name, I can tell you, and we do know what happened to this person. But this is not somebody who would warrant nationwide attention or worldwide attention. But in my opinion, this person is just as important in a homicide case and in forensic anthropology as the Romanovs. No less important. So let me introduce you to the victim. This is just this is where this person was discovered and out in the middle of no place and it took quite a while to find this individual. This is a, a pretty typical condition for a lot of the forensic cases that I get in eastern Colorado out in a very remote location and when discovered um, sort of mummified on the top and decomposing on the bottom near the ground and so what I have to do initially is to, um, after the pathologist is finished with what he needs to do, he or she needs to do, then I get started and take the soft tissue off. I know this is kind of the, this is the, the sort of gross side of this story. But I, sit, I take the soft tissue off and start looking for the skeletal clues. And I look for some things like the, the identity of the individual and then the circumstances surrounding death. So that's what I want to take you through tonight. But let me just show you a little bit about this individual. Some of the elements that we'll be looking at sternum, ribs. If you know something about uh, skeletal anatomy, you can see already that there are some things that are sort of interesting and, and very wrong about this case. This is the individual. So first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about what forensic anthropologists do. Some help law enforcement, as I do, help law enforcement locate clandestine graves um, and remains or remains on the surface and to assist in the recovery of remains and the associated evidence. So I get myself into some very strange kinds of situations. <laughs> this was in Nebraska looking for an individual who, would, who was supposedly stuffed into a rat hole in an oil well site. You can see here this is, the, this is the oil well itself right here. And then I'm stuffed down in the rat hole trying to look for the individual who was stuffed down in the rat hole in the oil well site. We never did find the individual. The, the person who was the... Uh, who let us know, let law enforcement know that, that this person was probably down in this rat hole and was stuffed in this rat hole 35 years before. That very um, afternoon was being tested for Alzheimer's, and, and we just did not get credible information from him, I don't believe. This is also another hole where I was stuffed down inside a mine shaft, and in that situation we actually did find the remains of an individual who had been in there for 22 years and a victim of a homicide and preserved well enough that we could even get um, the cut marks on the ribs and the cut marks on some of the clothing and could tie that back into um, a suspect. And the suspect has since, even after 22 years, has been prosecuted and is still in, in prison. Get myself into some other situations as well. This is important because there was a bird's nest up here and there were remains that were all over the ground down in here in an apple orchard. A lot of times we have to search in bird's nests because birds, especially some of the larger birds, will take bits of clothing, bits of hair, other bits of evidence and, and take them up into the, into the trees. 
Um, I get myself into these situations in part because I'm willing, because I think it's a whole lot of, of – it's a very interesting thing. Sometimes it's not fun, but it's a very interesting thing to go into these different situations, such as in a mine shaft or up in a tree, to try to look for remains. Um, plus, I'm, I can still prove it to myself that I can still do those sorts of things. <laughs> And then, at the end, when we find a clandestine grave, this is an actual grave of a woman who had disappeared two years before this photograph was taken, almost to the day, two years before. And so we're just doing a very detailed exhumation of the remains. Uh, again, the, the victim was identified, and the perpetrator who did this, who was a serial killer, uh, is now in prison and this will be in prison for a long time. The group I belong to that uh, Susan Marty was talking to you about is NecroSearch International. If you want to know more about that group, it's a totally volunteer group, multidisciplinary, and helps law enforcement for free. So we have geologists and geophysicists and botanists, entomologists, anthropologists, archaeologists. We all get together and we try to work to help solve these cases for them and help take the, the evidence to trial for them. What else does an anthropologist do, a forensic anthropologist? Well, some of us respond to mass fatality incidents. This is a Korean Airlines crash 801, flight 801, crashed in Guam in 1994. You can see that there's a, just a huge amount of chaos in a situation like that. So a forensic anthropologist's job, in part, is to try to make sense out of the chaos and to try to not only identify the victims, but also try to, to help the local law enforcement agencies and the medical examiner. In this particular case, this was the medical examiner who, after the plane crash, fled to Texas for a few days until they finally found him and brought him back and said, okay, no, listen, you really have to deal with this. Um, so, but to try to help him make sense out of what is going on on the ground. And then, of course, 9-11. My role in 9-11 was to spend a couple of weeks out at, the, at Long Island at the Fresh Kills Landfill to try to help sort uh, human from non-human remains and then send the human remains on to the medical examiner. This is a graduate student I was working with at the time, <clears throat> and we took it upon ourselves to, to look through the miles and miles and miles of debris, sometimes 40 feet high debris, to try to look for evidence of human remains before it went through all the various processes to try to, to rake out by hand, rake out to try to find the human remains. Um, found quite a few remains here. Um, we can talk about that later if you like. Also, what does a forensic anthropologist do? A forensic anthropologist uses skeletal clues to estimate or to diagnose forensic significance. And for example, at least once or twice a week, I get a, a, an email from local law enforcement or even law enforcement through the state of Colorado with a photograph like this. And they say, hey, you know, we're at a crime scene here, what we think may be a crime scene. We have three officers who are working overtime. Can we release this scene or do we have to shut this completely down and treat this as though it's a homicide case? So I look at this and try to look for clues to try to figure out whether or not it's human. What do you think? No. Why? It's not human. It's not human. In some cases, I asked them to send me a, an x-ray as well. But in this particular case, this occurred right around Easter. And I don't know if you can notice. Whoops. Shoot. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can notice or not, but there are all kinds of little thin slices in here. It's a spiral cut ham. I said, I said no, it's not human. As a matter of fact, uh, I can tell you what species it is, and don't worry about it. Uh, it somebody just discovered it in a dumpster and became very concerned about it. Okay, so this, however, of course, is human, right? I mean, everybody can see that. But what is different about this human cranium? It has writing all over it, right? If you take a closer look at it, you'll see that the writing actually consists of names of individuals, okay? Is this of forensic significance? If, if the coroner calls me, do I say, this is, and he told me, by the way, that this was found in Grandpa's attic. The, the grandchildren, after Grandpa died, went up and started cleaning out his attic. And so we found this in the attic, and what should we do? Is Grandpa a murderer? Is this a forensically significant? And I said, well, I don't think so, but let me just ask you, this was also found in the same container that the cranium was discovered in, right? It's a trophy skull. Is it of forensic significance? Well, it's illegal to take trophy skulls in, in the time of war. However, it happened all the time. It still probably happens now. And so what do you do? Do you prosecute Grandpa for having a trophy skull in, in his attic? No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. The time of war is hard enough. 
Um, also, Grandpa at this particular time had already passed, so it would be a little bit difficult to do anything like that. But no, is this a forensic significance for me? No, it isn't. You don't shut down crime scenes for this. Okay? It is significant, but it, I mean, it's a human being, but it's not, it doesn't have forensic significance. After that, then, after we determine that the remains are human and of forensic significance, then I am asked to determine the biological profile. And what is the biological profile? The sex of the remains, the age of the remains, the ancestry slash race of the remains, stature, little idiosyncrasies that we'll talk about in just a moment. We also will determine the circumstances surrounding death, including gunshot wounds, blunt trauma, sharp injury, and things like that. As a forensic anthropologist, usually I do not determine the cause and manner of death. That is for the medical examiner to do, the medical examiner or a coroner. There's only one state, Texas, in which the forensic anthropologist is legally um, allowed to determine the cause and manner of death. Every place else it is the medical examiner or coroner's job to do something like that. The other thing that's really fairly difficult for us is to determine the time since death. And, of course, that's a huge question. If you find remains that are out in the field, like our victim, how long has that person been there? Because it, it plays a huge part in who will be looked at as suspects, right? But it's very difficult because the environmental factors that have everything to do with decomposition rates and so on and, and the time of year and so on, even microclimates. If you're on the north side of a slope versus the south side of the slope, if you're under trees versus not, that plays a huge role in the decomposition rates. And so that's, this is something that we're working on right now as a group of individuals. Um, we think probably it will tie in directly to uh, the number of degree days uh, and determine how many days it is of a specific degree or number of degrees and then try to tie the decomposition rate into that. All kinds of variables there. What else? We use skeletal clues to compare antemortem photographs to the skull. This, uh, this is my only shot here at the, at the Romanovs, or the, my only um, offering of the Romanovs. This, the Russians think, is Anastasia's skull. And one of the ways that the medical examiner, Sergei Nikitin from Moscow, determined that this was Anastasia's skull was to put a face, or to superimpose the face of, from the photograph onto the skull. One of the problems with this is that it, under the best of times, it has a 10% error rate. And that is when you have a, an absolutely pristine, clean, complete skull, and you compare that to several different views of a photograph. In this particular case, this, this is not complete. The, when the Romanovs were killed in the Apatyev house in Ekaterinburg, they were brutalized. They were shot and bludgeoned and, and beaten. And so you can see that there's glue holding the, the, the skull together, and it was just in pieces. And so it was not a complete skull. But one of the things that we can do, if it is a complete skull, is to then superimpose the face, and you try to line up all of the, the aspects, all of the, the landmarks, including the ear, the nose, the base of the nose. You line up the orbits, and you line up the top of the cranium and the chin and so on. But you do that in several different views. This is carrying it to the final stage, and this is a photograph of Anastasia. But this is how the Russians identified this individual, and this is not how we would identify this individual. and caused a lot of problems with when we were trying to um, talk to them about their, their identification process. We also use skeletal clues to develop facial approximations, and this again is Anastasia. And this uh, reconstruction done the Russian way, where you, you reconstruct the muscles on the cranium and on the mandible before you put the, the final soft tissue on. This also was done by, by Nikitin, and this looks rem just exactly like, remarkably like uh, Anastasia, like the photographs of Anastasia. And I hate to say this, but one of my questions was, not directly to him, but one of my questions was, well, did you know what Anastasia looked like before you put this face on this skull? Well, of course he did. Of course he did. So... I, I do not agree with their identification of Anastasia. We can use skeletal clues to compare facial photographs, such as, and I do, I've done several of these, where you identify or you try to identify whether or not this is the same individual that, as was represented in the, the ATM. Okay? It's very tricky to do. You can see the quality of the ATM photograph. It's not very good. So it's, it's a very tricky thing to do. We also compare the skeletal mic, uh, macrostructure and microstructure in radiographs. So that, this is the antemortem or before death uh, chest x-ray of this woman. This is the postmortem chest x-ray after she was found burned in a car. Her husband, by the way, is now in prison. 
Um, but if you compare the microstructure and the microstructure, the macrostructure and the microstructure of these vertebrae here, they are the same as these vertebrae. And this is good enough evidence to help establish a positive identification. That, with all the other circumstantial evidence and, and so on, uh, led to a positive identification in this individual. So, now I've told you what, some of what a forensic anthropologist does. So what does an anthropologist not do? We don't solve crimes <laughs> in an hour, <laughs> minus commercials. We do not have romantic, I can't speak for all my colleagues, but we do not have romantic relationships with all the detectives that come along. We do not work in a glamorous laboratory, very clean, sparkling environment. We do not work in revealing attire <laughs> with three-inch heels. And we don't depend on holograms for anything. They don't exist. They don't exist. That's the one thing that drives me nuts about Bones, the, the series Bones, is that every time they have a question to be answered, they go right to the hologram. And you have to sort of do a preemptive strike when you're talking to the jury and say these things that, you know what, we don't have a hologram. I'm sorry. We did not do a hologram for this case. We don't have a hologram. Okay, so let's talk about our victim here. Let's sort of take it through. The first thing that I like to do, the first thing that we do, is to determine the sex of the individual. Now, we're not talking gender here. There's a big difference. Sex is the biological aspects, the biological determination. Um, gender is a social construct. Okay, So I don't know how this person identified him or herself socially. All I can do is look at the skeletal clues and tell you whether or not they're consistent with male or female. There have been a couple of people who have taken a class in anthropology who have gone out there and said, you know what, I don't know what this, um, what this pelvic girl is, so it must be homosexual. And that's just, just ridiculous. Okay, so what is the best area for determining sex in the skeleton? What would you think? The pelvic girdle, right? Because it is the natural selection area, okay? If you have a very narrow pelvis, pelvic outlet, and you're trying to pass a big-headed infant through that narrow orifice, then it becomes more difficult. Not so much now, of course, because we have cesarean sections. But the one thing that, that I wanted to show you on this, this is morphing from the superior view of a male pelvic girdle to a female pelvic girdle. And all of the changes that we look at um, in a female pelvic girdle, all of the differences really have to do with widening that outlet. Okay, so if you look, look at the sacrum right here, and in males it's fairly narrow, in females it's fairly wide, right? Brings the ilia out. If you look at the front here, the pubic bone is fairly wide in females and it's pretty narrow in males. Look at the subpubic angle here. See how it widens out in females? It's really wide in females, but it's really very narrow in males. This is the greater sciatic notch here. Look at how wide that becomes. And the reason for that is basically you can think of it as bringing the sacrum away from the pelvic outlet. Okay? So everything that we look at, and also look at the fact that the ilium here becomes a little bit more bowl-shaped. All of these things we look at, and even if you have a fairly small piece of that pelvic girdle, you can determine quite a bit about the sex of the individual. Okay? So let's look at the front. The... <clears throat> the Male pelvic girdle, if you look, the subpubic angle, this is the pubic bone here, okay? This is the ischium and the ilium, and then the sacrum is in the back. The pubic bone has a subpubic angle of this very narrow in males, just as we demonstrated, and it's really much wider in females, okay? If we look at the side, we'll see that the, um, that the sacrum is also very wide, but this is a typical male pubic bone, See the narrow um, pubic angle here, and also it's fairly narrow from side to side. This is a typical female. It's wider from side to side, and it has a wider subpubic angle. These are the most important areas for the determination of sex in the, in the skeleton. This is an unknown, okay? This is not our unknown, but this is an unknown. Do you think that that's male or female? Narrow subpubic angle, fairly narrow from side to side. This is a male, okay? This is a greater sciatic notch. From the side, you can see that in the females, it has a wider angle. There is a wider angle. In males, it is a much more narrow angle. Okay? Now let's look at our victim. This is a pelvic girdle of our victim. You can see that it's in pieces, and we'll get to that in a little while. But do you notice the greater sciatic notch? Okay? Male or female? Mm, nope, it's male. 
Okay, that's a male greater cytic notch. But let's look at this bone right here. It's in fragments. So you're not forensic anthropologist yet, huh? <laughs> well, we'll get to that. So let's take this fragment, which happens to be part of the pubic bone, and let's compare that up here to the male. Okay, and we'll sort of dim that out a little bit so you can see the outline of the male and the outline of our pubic bone. And then let's take the, another copy of it, and let's take it down here to the female pelvic girdle and then dim that out. Now what do you think? Yeah, it's male, just as a male. Okay, now let's look at a, a, just a, some little idiosyncrasies here. If we're looking again at this area, just one side, and we're looking at the inside of the pelvic girdle instead of the outside, sometimes we see these little pits. They're dorsal pits. They're sometimes called parturition pits, and they sometimes occur, very often occur, actually, um, during the, the parturition process. If, an, if a woman, if I see this, and I see it, that it is this detailed, then I will say that this is a woman who likely has had at least one child. Okay? So, if I, and, and the depth and severity of the pits does not give you an idea about how many kids the, person, the woman has had. It's just, it's kind of variable that way. But, so, if I had a, just a half dollar piece of bone, if I had to choose which area of the body that I would want to see in a skeleton, it would be that area right there. Because right now I can determine the sex of the individual. And if it's female, I might be able to say something about whether or not this individual has had children. It gets better than that. We'll get to that area in just a little bit. The second area for determining sex in the skeleton is usually the cranium. And this is the area that you don't get in trouble looking at the people in the park. Um, so you can, you can look at the cranium and see what the sexual differences are there. Very often males have a brow ridge. Females typically don't. Typically males have a more sloping forehead. Typically females have a more globular forehead. Typically males have greater areas for muscle insertion, a larger areas for muscle insertion throughout the body than do, male, than do females. And males, of course, in the population are typically larger than females. And so that you get measurements of the various aspects of the skeleton and you can uh, determine whether it's likely, percentage-wise, uh, probability statement about whether or not you have a male or female. Now let's talk about the dental and skeletal age estimation. Okay. Oops, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to edit that out, right? Okay. The estimation of age. The best areas really depend on the general age category, in the very young or the teen or the adult. In the very young to late teens, dental development, dental development and then dental eruption, and then bone development are the best areas for age determination in the skeleton. Dental development, the teeth develop from the crown, to the roots. This is an incomplete development of the roots, not broken off, it just is not yet completely developed. And in a young individual, you can see something that looks like this, not cut away typically. Typically, we have to take an x ray of it, but you see all the deciduous or baby teeth up here, just ready to come out, and then the permanent dentition that's underneath. And this occurs, of course, at different times in different, uh, in different, uh, at different ages in different um, children. And we know that, of course, because we've all seen the little kids losing their teeth at different ages and different, different teeth at different ages. Then let's talk about the bone growth. We need to talk about the diaphysis, which is the primary center of bone growth. In this six-month-old fetus, you can see that all of the bones are just the primary centers of bone growth. Just to, they start from one cell. Each one of these bones start from one cell, and they just increase in size and keep growing and growing throughout the, the – until – the mid to late teens. The epiphysis is the secondary center of bone growth. This is the diaphysis, or the primary center. And then you have several epiphyses in this femur. Okay? You have a little epiphysis that starts again from one cell, and then it keeps growing. And it grows and grows and grows until finally, and the growth is right in the area in between, finally that secondary center of bone growth will fuse to the primary center of bone growth, and then in that situation all growth ceases. If it happens too late, you end up with a giant. If it happens too early, you can end up with a, a very short individual or a, a this is an achondroplastic dwarf, which is a, a whole different category. This is a normal size femur. This is the femur of an achondroplastic dwarf. Okay? There are some other sort of developmental changes, developmental problems with that, but that in a nutshell is sort of what's going on. Okay? This is 
a progression from newborn. You can see only the diaphysis, diaphyses. Here you can see the diaphyses as well. There you start seeing the secondary centers of bone growth at this stage. This is a radius. You don't see one yet for the ulna. The carpals, the wrist bones are developing more and more. You can see the little epiphyses for all the, the uh, metacarpals and the phalanges. And then you can see a little bit more of a progression in someone who is five years old. And then this is, this is a, a photograph that I showed this morning um, to the fifth graders. This is closer to the age at which they are. Closer, it's not, it's, this is a little bit older than they were. And then you can see the little line of union still sort of peeking through here. And then this is the wrist of an adult. All right, this is what it looks like in dry bone. This is what the epiphyseal surface looks like, or the, uh, the area uh, between the, the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And this is what it looks like just when you're looking at the line that's left over. This is what it looks like in a non-human. This is one of the things, one of the big clues that I can use uh, when somebody, when law enforcement sends me a photograph of a bone and asks me to determine whether or not it's human. A lot of the food bones that we get, the ham hocks and the lamb and the, and the chicken bones are a little bit different story, but those kinds of things, um, you, they're young individuals. They're still young animals, and still, so you get the epiphyseal surface. And then a lot of, especially larger mammals, you get this sort of crown effect at the epiphyseal surface instead of having it be fairly, fairly flat. You still get that sort of crinkly surface, but it's, it's in a crown effect. So if I see that, then, of course, I'm the genius. I can send it back and say in five seconds and say, nope, it's not human. Okay? Yeah, this, you, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. There, you have to memorize this very quickly, okay? These are some of the ages at which the epiphyses fuse to the diaphysis. This is a female, and they usually occur about... A year or two before the male does in a population, in a given population. But the populations differ as well. Okay? But you can see that in these individuals, there are a couple, in, in, including the, the vertebrae are later on, uh, a fuse later on, um, some of the, the rings around the vertebrae. But the medial clavicle can fuse as late as 33 years. The iliac crest can fuse actually a little later than 24. But these are some of the average ages. Okay, now we're back to our victim. Is this an adult or a subadult? I don't see any epiphyseal lines whatsoever. This is an adult. Okay? Then when we're an adult, then we start talking. We still have some morphological changes, but for the most part, we're talking about degenerative changes. After about 30 years, it's all downhill. We re seriously, we all start just going through all the degenerative kinds of changes. One of the things that we can use, this still is a morphological change, is the, in the pubic symphysis. And again, there's that area. That one area that, that is just my favorite area in the whole skeleton is this right here, the pubic symphysis. And it, she, that sounds really bad to say, doesn't it? Um, don't tell anybody I said that. But um, the, the, you go through some morphological changes. This is an individual, that, this is a very young pubic symphysis here. This is sort of late teens, early 20s mean age, okay? This individual, and these are not all of the standards that we use. These are, I just picked a few of them out here. But this individual probably averages about 30 years, plus or minus, okay? And, so, and as you get older, the plus or minus really gets much, much larger. Uh, the whole life experiences and the genetics and nutrition and, and disease and everything sort of plays into whole life experience and increases that, that um, variation within the pubic bone and throughout the body, too. It makes it more difficult to determine the age in an older individual. This individual is more is sort of averaging around uh, 45 or so, and this individual is averaging around 60, Okay. And there have been more um, studies done, and so we're adding another stage, another phase to this above um, age 60 or so. But by the time you get to age 60, you're talking about plus or minus 20 years or so. And so we have to use some other ways to determine age on an adult skeleton even beyond that. Okay, this is not our victim's pubic bone. Our victim's pubic bone you saw was really pretty fragmentary, but this is one that was very similar to our victim's pubic bone. So which of these phases, one, three, five, or six, is this most similar to? Yep, five. Okay, so we're talking about an average age of about 45 plus or minus. All right? As a matter of fact, our victim was 43. Okay. The other area that we can sometimes use is in the sternal end of the fourth rib. And the sternal end of the fourth rib goes from a very young kind of a pattern here 
up to an older kind of a pattern where you develop kind of a, claw, a crab claw kind of appearance. Um, our victim was sort of in the middle here, but it, we'll, we can look at that in a minute. And then we start talking about the real degenerative kinds of changes, the real diseased vertebrae, um, the arthritic knees, like this kind of mushrooming out knees. Uh, we look at the reducing, the receding spongy bone. This is the spongy bone, and this is right at the hip, right? This is the neck of the femur, the head of the femur, and then the shaft of the femur. And you start seeing, as in, with advancing age, you start seeing receding spongy bone, and at the same time you start seeing a reduction in this cortical bone and the real hard, compact bone as well. And then you get something like this. This is a 93-year-old woman, and look at how thin the cortical bone is here, and there's just no spongy bone left whatsoever in that. This was a, a cadaver during anatomy class, and I was trying to pick up the leg when we were doing a dissection, put my thumb right through that femur, the shaft of that femur. It was so delicate, it was so thin, that it was, it was just practically not there. One of the other sad things about this is when you look at the other side of that, the, that knee right here, look at these striations. And the polishing, this is hibernation here. This is just degradation. This is just falling apart. But if you look at that polishing and then look at the inside of the kneecap, the inside of the patella, you think that was painful? There was no cartilage left in that, uh, between that patella and the, and the distal femur. It, was, it must have been incredibly painful. And then sometimes people use dental wear, but that's really good in horses, but it doesn't work very well in humans. <laughs> Okay, ancestry. One of the things I want to show you here, the, you know, this is all about, okay, what can we tell from the skeleton? And we're getting better at trying to determine the area of the world from which someone's ancestors came, okay? And we're getting a little bit better than just saying, okay, this is European male, this is a European American male, an African American male. And by the way, I can't say that in a report because when I'm dealing with an unknown individual, I can't say this is an African American. I don't know if he's an American. I don't know where he's living, you know, or where he did live. Um, I, all I can say is that his the features are consistent with an African American ancestry, or he has African ancestry. And here again, I want to show you that that there is a great deal of variation between the so-called races, between the so-called uh, between populations too. There's a great deal of variation, and I want to show you some of that variation in just a second. But the other thing is, again, we're going from biological clues to a social identity. And think about how people really differ in their identity. If they want to portray themselves as one group or as a member of one group, they will say that they are a member of that one group, whether or not their skeleton um, tells that story. And so sometimes <clears throat> I will say, well, this individual shows characteristics of an Eastern European origin, but that person may not be socially seen as that time, uh, kind of individual, as that person. So it, that's what, where it's really tricky. And this is where the anthropology, this is the anthropology sort of hall of shame. Back in the 19th century, this was a classification system. The Caucasoids, okay, were in Europe, Near East, in Egypt. And what I want you to look at here is the fact that we have just pigeonholed a whole group of individuals, many different populations, into one category, Caucasoid. Mongoloid, which is in itself seen as a pejorative term, includes the people in the Far East and Native Americans. What different individuals you're looking at there? Also, Negroid, Africa, except for Egypt, and Australoid, Australia. That also takes out a lot of populations in the world, right? So we're, we luckily are getting away from that sort of thing. We are talking about in, in anthropology terms, and this is what most of us do at this point, is to say, okay, we have European ancestry, African ancestry, North American ancestry, Eastern European ancestry, Western African ancestry, that kind of thing. And we're getting better about doing that. We're getting better at looking some of the characteristics. And it's not just one characteristic that tells you one class to another class to another class. It's a whole series. You have to look at the entire individual. European people of the European ancestry, we all know this, okay? This is, again, what you can see in a park bench as you're walking people, uh, watching people go by. The people of European ancestry tend to have a more narrow nasal root, right, a narrow nasal bridge, a narrow nasal aperture or opening, have a fairly narrow face, and so on. If you have somebody from African ancestry, and this, uh, this is just a gross generalization here, 
but because the, there are big differences between North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, South Africa, and so on. But you have somebody with a, a more a wider nasal root, a wider nasal bridge, a wider nasal aperture. Also, in people of European ancestry, this is called the nasal sill. This is the that break and contour, contour between the maxilla and inside the nasal aperture. And it's very sharp, typically, in people of European ancestry, and it's more rounded in people of African ancestry. If you have someone who is Native American ancestry, again, we tend to, to lump all those into one category, Native American. But when you start really looking at it, and you look at, at even archaeological populations from eastern United States and northern, northwestern populations and southwestern populations, they're incredibly different. They're very different populations and have very different features. So we have to watch out for that a little bit. One of the features that we can use is that, that all, about, all but about 10% of Native Americans in most populations have this characteristic called a shovel-shaped incisor. Um, many populations have just a, an incisor. This is the upper central incisor. Have an incisor that is just a blade incisor and does not have these little buttresses on the side here. But when we see that, we sort of think, mm, you know, there might be a possibility that, that this individual has Native American ancestry. There are some other characteristics too, such as the shape of the palate and, and so on. But look at the high cheekbones in this individual as well. Okay. Japanese female, see just some differences here. There, look at the Eskimo. When you think about somebody with the high cheekbones, look at the cheekbones here. Just the height and also the degree to which they project away from the front of the face before it recedes away from the front of the face. Very wide face. Australian. Australian Aborigine. Okay. This is our victim. What do you think? European. It's a European ancestry. Okay. So, Caucasian. This is, I usually say to law enforcement or to the medical examiner, this is this individual is of European ancestry, um, and he was. Okay. What else do we do? Circumstances surrounding death: gunshot wounds, blunt trauma, sharp injury. We'll start with blunt trauma. Okay. This is an X-ray of very blunt trauma, just a devastating injury to the tibia and fibula. You notice there's a fracture here, but also a couple of fractures right here. Now, one of the things that we can look at is this is right at the time that this event occurred. This was an x-ray that was taken right at the time that, that this fracture occurred. This was taken a couple of months later after this individual had been in a cast for a couple of months. And you notice, I'm sure many of you in here are physicians, and you can say this just as much as I can, but you notice that there is a projection of bone, a bony callus that is projecting up here and sort of rounding out that, those edges. It's trying to stabilize that bone, right? What that would look like in an individual where you were just looking at dry bone, where you had a fracture that was not reduced correctly and where it's still stabilized, right? It's still a nice stable uh, bone, but it will have these rounded edges like this. Okay, you can see where the original line of fracture was here, right? And where it slipped down on, on itself, but it's a nice, stable bone at this point, okay? So, we use that information to look at whether or not a, a trauma, a gunshot wound was antemortem, occurred before death, and whether or not it shows signs of healing, whether it was paramortem, which means that it occurred about the time of death, or if it occurred post-mortem, in which case it will show some fracture patterns of more dry bone. Can you see a little bit of a problem with this definition? Paramortem for a pathologist means that the heart has stopped. It is an episode, it is something that is, has occurred to make the heart stop. Okay, so there's no more bruising, there's no more bleeding, anything like that. Okay? With, with skeletons, however, we have to look at a very much longer period of time that will also include paramortem. And I've had, I listened one time to a, somebody who's now a colleague of mine complain that she was saying that a victim had paramortem trauma and the defense attorney was complaining, was asking, okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that it occurred right at death? Yes. Does that mean that it could have occurred a week after death? Yes. Could it have occurred a month after death? And at that point, she's saying, why does the prosecuting attorney not rescue me? The right answer to that is because you don't need rescuing. What you should have said at the very beginning is that 
Paramortem trauma in bone really has more to do with the organic component that is still in the bone relative to the mineral component. Bone consists of two different components. It has the mineral component to it and also has the organic component or the soft tissue component. I took this chicken bone. This is for the fifth graders, but it works here too. I took this chicken bone, and I'm sure a lot of you have done this. You put it in vinegar for a couple of weeks, and it dissolves all the, the, organ, the inorganic component out of the bone, all the mineral component. So all you're left with is just this organic, nice little rubbery bone. Okay? This is all the organic component left. And it means that when, when a bone is subjected to trauma, when it still has all this organic component to it, it bends a little bit before it actually fractures. And then as it bends and bends and bends, it will reach its elastic limit and finally break. But it breaks in a specific way that we'll talk about in just a minute. And that specific way will tell me that, yes, this is consistent with a paramortem trauma. If this organic component was completely gone in the bone and all, all it had left was just mineral component, it would be like smacking a, a piece of calcium with a hammer. You would get a different kind of a fracture pattern. You would not get any kind of bending before that bone finally reached its elastic, component, elastic limit and broke. All right? So if we are trying to determine, we'll go back to antemortem here for a minute. If we're trying to determine whether or not somebody survived a blow these are two gunshot, well, actually, one of them is a gunshot wound. The one on the left here is a gunshot wound, an exit wound, and this is a poor guy who got hit by a train. Okay? Who survived? Which one survived? The guy who got hit by the train, right? And the way that we know that is because of the rounded edges of the wound. This guy survived for quite a while. He had some radiating fracture lines, radiating away from this original injury. Even those are starting to heal. The zygomatic arch here has just got a little crook in it here because it was fractured as well. This poor guy lived in a nursing home for a few, few years before he finally, for a few years, before he finally wandered out into a lake and died. But he survived. This fellow did not. And this actually I have. I brought some friends here so that you can see these afterwards. Um, but this, this is this. These are all casts, by the way. I made all these, but they are taken from original specimens. And this is a Civil War. This is from the Civil War. So you see the entry wound here. We'll talk about gunshot wounds in just a second, and then the exit wound here. But uh, this individual did not survive this. Was that par paramortem? Yes, most likely. Most likely that was paramortem. Okay, now... This, I took these, okay, I just had a heck of a good time trying to bash chicken bones in preparation for the fifth graders, but, but it turns out that the fracture patterns actually work out pretty well to sort of demonstrate what's going on. This force, I hit this with a hammer. I was doing all kinds of dastardly things to chicken bones, okay? And you can see that at the very top, okay, the hammer was coming down like this, and you have compression forces in the bone. This is an area of compression forces in here, whereas the other side of the bone, you have tension forces, right? Bone will withstand compression forces way much longer than it can withstand tension forces. So it will start to fail. That elastic limit will reach its limit at the tension side before it does at the compression side. So it will start to fracture here. All right, and this is going to become really cool when, we start, when I show you something else here. And then this is a little bit longer a little bit farther into the process, and you'll see that this, the tension area is um, achieving a gap. But look at this pattern. This is a classic, what is called a butterfly pattern, butterfly fracture pattern, where the fracture lines start here, and then they just sort of spread out into this kind of butterfly look here, all right? And then this is when it finally just completely fails. This is a car accident victim. This is a car pedestrian accident. Okay? We're looking at the front of the tibia here. All right? The front of the right tibia. All right? Did the, did the force, did the car, now this is important in some accident reconstructions, right? Did the car come from the victim's right or did the car come from the victim's left? From the victim's right. Exactly. Isn't that cool? I just had to throw this in. I tell, I tell you, I was doing all kinds of really wicked things to these chicken boats. Can you believe this? This is not photoshopped. This is a 24-pound cinder block that I hung with a, from a zip tie from this chicken boat. I have not yet uh, experimented long enough to see just how much that will withstand, but I was pretty impressed with that. 
Okay, now, so then I took that cinder block. <laughs> You're going to break, chicken bone. You're going to break. And then I just I brought it down, moment of impact, moment after impact. And you can see that there's a piece of chicken bone that's kind of flying off here and then a little piece right there. Well, this had a fantastic fracture pattern, just classic for a crushing injury. Now, this looks like it would be here, right? This piece, but it actually isn't. It's this piece down in here where the cinder block has pinched it up against this, this other board here. But look at the crushing injury, okay? So you have this crushing injury here, but there are a couple of other really neat things about this. One is the fact that this piece has reached its elastic limit up in here, but it's still attached to bone down in here, okay? It has not reached its elastic limit there. So that is very typical for a paramortem kind of an injury, comparamorum kind of crushing injury. Um, it's just, it's, and also, this area right in here is sort of curled around as well. It's, it's curled in part because it's following the shaft of the bone, but it's also kind of curled around as well um, in another way. All right, so we're back to our pelvic girdle, okay? Does it look kind of like blunt trauma? It is very definitely blunt, blunt trauma, and I'll tell you what happened to him at the end here, okay? How about this, however, okay? So a lot of the fractures of many, most of his ribs, all right? This is the posterior aspect where it's up against the vertebral column. You see a lot of the fractures here. Let's take a little bit closer look at one of them especially. Look at this. You see that sort of classic crushing injury? When I tell you what happened to him, you'll know why. All right, when we look at the front, you'll see some fractures in here. Consistent with paramortem fractures, there are some more of our fractures in the back here. Oh, what's going on here? What's going on right here? Is that blunt trauma? It's sharp injury. That's sharp trauma. That is a cut mark right there. And there's a cut mark here as well. It's blunt trauma here, but it's a cut mark here. And you can have blunt trauma, by the way, and sharp trauma in the same injury, right? If you, if you take a knife and you go all the way up to the hilt, the hilt causes the, the blunt trauma, whereas the knife is causing the sharp injury. All right? Sharp injury all over the back of his head. No, it wasn't. That's sharp injury. That's all sharp force. That's all a knife. And there are 50. I counted there are 50 wounds on the cranium. All right, let's talk about gunshot wounds just a bit. Entry, exit. Okay? The entry wound is a, usually a fairly small hole. It depends, of course, on the caliber and so on. Okay, and by the way, you cannot determine the caliber by the size of the by the size of the hole and so on. I'm, there are just too many variables there. A lot of times you'll see these radiating fracture lines away that occur very, very quickly, and then sometimes even not in this individual, but sometimes and this is not our victim, by the way, this is a this is just to illustrate what a gunshot wound looks like. Sometimes you'll get concentric wing, rings that are it's just like putting a pebble in a pond and just increasing diameters of concentric rings around that, which is really very useful because if you have only a part of the cranium and you see those concentric rings, you can kind of go smaller, smaller, smaller and point to the general area where the gunshot wound may have entered. And then the exit wound shows the beveling, very characteristic beveling. You would see this kind of beveling on the inside of this wound, and you would see this kind of pattern on the inside of this wound here. So you see the fracture patterns, the, the beveling uh, fracture patterns, so that you can tell that that is the exit. All right? So, having said that, this is our victim. What is that? Okay, yes it is. It's also entrance. Okay, what happens, now those that we showed before are going directly into the cranium, right? They're going directly into the cranium, like this. But the cranium is a rounded surface. What happens if you shoot it tangentially? You can have the entrance and the exit in the same hole, right? It's a classic keyhole fracture, classic key keyhole gunshot wound. So you have the beveling on the inside down here, whoops, dang it, down here, and you have the beveling on the outside up here with the associated radiating fracture lines. This caused a problem between myself and the coroner that I'll talk to you about in just a moment. Actually, I'll talk to you about it right now. You can see some of the radiating fracture lines that are kind of occurring around the front here as well. All right, 43-year-old victim, just minding his own business at night, goes into a liquor store and buys a 12-pack of beer. 
He comes out, and two teenagers and a 21-year-old um, take him and decide that they want that 12-pack of beer. And so they go, and they first of all, they stab him repeatedly. He falls to the ground. This is all, they've all confessed to this now. <clears throat> and actually, one of the juveniles just couldn't take it anymore and went to his dad and told his dad that, yes, we did it, and this is how it happened. And they told the law enforcement how it happened. They stabbed him repeatedly. He fell on the ground. They could hear him sort of gasping a little bit, and so they shot him in the chest. Okay? And then they got in the car, and they ran over him. Pelvic girdle fractures, right? Rib fractures. Ran over him and then backed up and ran over him again. Drove away, got scared, came back the next day and dragged him to that really remote location out in the middle of nowhere. So, okay, so here is the problem. I was at the autopsy. I'm quite frequently at the autopsy when the pathologist is doing his work. And the, the pathologist has to do his work before I can ever get involved in the case because I take all the soft tissue off so that I can get at the skeleton, okay? So I'm standing there waiting for the pathologist to finish, and I ask for an X-ray, a full-body X-ray. And I look at the ribs. Now, I've heard this story now, just now. And I say, okay, let's look and see in the chest. You look at the ribs. There is no lead residue whatsoever in the chest, Okay. But there is just a tiny little bit of residue in the cranium that I, I could show you just if, if you like. There's a little bit of residue in the cranium just right on the very top part, just right up in here. There's a little bit of residue. And I looked at that x-ray, and then I took the soft tissue off as he was working on the rest of the body. I took the soft tissue off of that, and I said, um, this is a classic keyhole, gunshot wound, fracture. And now remember the story was that they shot him in the chest, they stabbed him in the head, then they ran over him twice. Pathologist turned to the detective and said, we need to get these guys off the, off the streets. We need to get these guys. Dr. France may be right. That may be a keyhole fracture, but I say go with the story that that's a stab wound in the head and they had shot him in the chest. What would you do in that situation? These are bad guys. These are violent criminals. What would you do? What I did is I took the detective aside and I said, you know, the pathologist can put whatever he wants in his report. My report is going to say that that is a classic keyhole gunshot wound. It may hurt your case, but I can't in all good conscience say that that is sharp injury. I can't do that. Regardless of what it does to the case, I can't do that. I can't say that he was shot in the chest when I have absolutely no evidence that he was shot in the chest. So the kids confessed. The, they did some time. The juveniles, of course, did less time than the, than the adult. Uh, I think that by now they are probably, the juveniles at least, are probably back out on the street. But uh, his name is uh, Peter Michaels. And like I say, I think he deserves the truth. Are there any questions? Kind of a sobering um, case. Um.